Hello everyone. Welcome back to another Live at Five. I am Kevin Adkison, Associate Curator with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. And today I am visiting the Collections Wing attached to Cranbrook Art Museum. And uh, I'm grateful to Director Andrew Blauvelt for letting us broadcast from the Art Museum's vault today. And I wanted to focus on a artist that those of you who have been around Cranbrook for a long time, I'm sure know well, if you didn't know him himself. Um, and if you are newer to Cranbrook, you might not be aware of this great Hungarian-American painter, Zoltán Zepeshi. And behind me is a rack of Zoltán Zepeshi's work. They're actually three painting racks worth of Mr. Zepeshi's paintings here. And so I thought that I would pull three different racks out for us to study today. Um, if you have never been to campus and visited us, this is the art museum's collection wing. So the ramp of the Chinese dog is directly behind it. The main entrance to the art museum is right there. Um, but this is the permanent collection of Cranbrook Art Museum. Uh, this building was designed by Smith Group, JJR, and it opened in 2011. And it houses mostly the collection of Cranbrook Art Museum, but Cranbrook Archives is located downstairs. Uh, and then there are also treasures from the different Cranbrook collections of cultural properties. Uh, which are overseen by the Center for Collections and Research and include things like all of the original hand-woven rugs from Studio Loya Saarinen that you see stored safely with perfect temperature and humidity controls there. Now, the art museum has reopened, so if you are local and you want to come by, come and visit Cranbrook Art Museum. Uh, Wednesday through Sunday from noon to five, and on Thursdays it's open till eight. You do need to sign up in advance, so go online and get your ticket before you come. Um, unfortunately, the collections wing is closed for the time being, uh, and so your virtual tour today is the only way that you can see the uh, collections wing for now until we know a bit more about where the world is headed. So let's get started talking about our great Hungarian-American Zoltán Zepeshi. So he was born to a father who was working in the Hungarian government in Kasha, Hungary in 1898. Um, his youth was spent in Hungary. Um, as he wrote, I was born into a horribly rich family, one of those feudal environments. Um, he studied for four and a half years at the Royal Academy of Art in Budapest and then at the Fine Art Academy in Vienna. He studied art and art education. Here's a portrait of the artist done at Cranbrook in the 1930s. During World War I, he was in his own telling, which Zoltan loved to uh, enhance his sort of biography to, depending on who was asking him his history. But in his own telling, he went through three revolutions during World War I, and his family lost the family castle, uh, and he was quite penniless when he arrived in New York in 1921. He stayed with his $5 off of the boat with an uncle, uh, and he worked different odd jobs in New York, including as a lumber, at a lumber mill. Um, he cleaned floors. He swept the floor of a barber shop. He also painted um, calcium in closets, which was thought to help against moths. Um, his uncle died, and he ended up in Detroit, where he was uh, made a, a career as a sign painter. Uh, he then also began exploring the Wild West. Back in Hungary, he had seen Buffalo Bill on a world tour, and Buffalo Bill said, come to America and come say hello. I don't think he ever found Buffalo Bill, but he did head out west. And in 1920, uh, the mid-1920s, he visited the Taos Artist Colony, which is the first set of paintings that we'll see here, are two paintings by Zepeshi 
done in the 1920s of Taos, or inspired by Taos. And so there you see the mule and the horse in the American Southwest. Zepeshi often made his own frames, and so most of the works that you're seeing are in frames that he also made just for the individual painting. In 1926, he returned to Detroit, um, and he began teaching here in America. Remember, he had studied art and art education back at the Royal Academy Budapest. And so he started teaching at Wayne State and at the Detroit Society of Arts and Crafts. At the same time, he began doing renderings uh, of buildings for Albert Kahn and Associates. And it was through his friendship with Eliel Saarinen, who he knew in Detroit, as Zepeshi said, Finns and Hungarians are first cousins, so of course we knew each other. Uh, but it was also through Albert Kahn that Zepeshi is introduced to George Booth. And George Booth had been told, if you're going to have painting at this new Cranbrook Academy of Art, you need to have an Eastern European instructor because those are the finest academies and that's how you will get someone who properly knows how to paint. And uh, your comment about Cezanne, one of Zepeshi's teachers, none of his teachers can I pronounce their very Hungarian names, but one of his teachers was a student of Cezanne. So um, Zepeshi is one removed from Cezanne, and his education at the Royal Academy Budapest was in this sort of um, Hungarian thread of the French Impressionist movement. So in 1931, Zepeshi is hired by George Booth and Eliel Saarinen to come and start a painting department. And he would spend the rest of his career here at Cranbrook as both instructor in painting and then as director of the painting department. Finally, in 1946, he was appointed director as of the Academy of Art. And in 1959, he was made president of the Academy. And that was in conjunction with Cranbrook becoming accredited by the North Central Association of Colleges and Secondary Schools. And so he served as president of the Academy of Art until 1966 when he retired. He was supposed to take a year off and then come back to Cranbrook. However, he never took the year off. He showed up for the first day of classes the next year, and President Glenn Paulson, his successor, introduced him as the youngest member of the Academy. He died of cancer in 1974 at the age of 76, and he was the longest served um, instructor at Cranbrook. So he was dated all the way back to Millis and Saarinen, who uh, we're both off of the scene by 1951. Zepeshi was still here into the 1970s. So now that we have a little bit of his history out of the way, let's look at some of my favorite paintings. Um, now, even though he had been classically trained at the fine art academies of Europe, he taught at Cranbrook with my favorite quote, I teach by not teaching. And so he Instructed the students is a, is a loose term. Uh, he mostly was painting in his own uh, very organized studio. He was fastidiously clean, uh, and he kept a very uh, clean workshop or painting studio, which you can see an abstraction of his Cranbrook painting studio here. And it's a little bit hard to see, but I think you see the artist there. You can see the abstraction of an easel on the right and then the painter in the center with all the paintings sort of around the sides. And his paintings are, they become more abstract in the 1950s, but for the most part, he never leaves representational art. He does develop over time, uh, and he is sort of one of these painters that is impossible to classify. Um, some people call him an impressionist, uh, American regionalist. He goes through all these different styles, and Zepeshi's own writing about it uh, was that any artist who doesn't change style uh, isn't uh, sort of focused on the future, um, that the only way to be an artist was to constantly be changing your style. Let's see. I want to start with some of his earlier works. Um, Dorothy Zepeshi, his first wife, and Zoltan had a place on the 
sort of pinky of Michigan, um, down below Stephen Bear, Sleeping Bear Dunes in Frankfort, Michigan. And so a lot of his paintings were done in the summers there. And so here you see uh, this small northern Michigan fishing town. And if we get closely, you can see these hash marks. It almost looks like it's an etching or an engraving. The way that Zepeshi painted was entirely with egg tempera, uh, which is, of course, a, a very ancient technique used all the way through the Renaissance when oil paints became more common. But he was unusual to be working in egg tempera. And so he would use these sable or weasel brush brushes that have really very pronounced bristles. And so you see the brush strokes of this mixture of egg yolk pigment and then a binder, either vinegar or white wine or even water works as a binder. And he would build up the paintings using these pigments. He very rarely used white. So the white that you're seeing is the ground of the canvas. Um, and so it's a, it's a really very methodical and meticulous and quite laborious way of painting. Uh, I think you can tell he's not a painter who really sat down and just went at a blank canvas. He had to meticulously plan out these pieces because his colors, you can also only use egg tempera for about two days before it dries out. And so he would plan these pieces out in sketches. He would transfer them onto his prepared sheet of masonite. And then he would use a needle and he would poke through his sketch to transfer his pencil drawing on trace paper onto the prepared masonite. And then he would carefully build up layers of color, almost like watercolor, um, where you are creating depth by these layers. He only would ever use sort of 15 to 18 colors per canvas. And what I think is interesting, as his career moves on, his style shifts, um, but the subject matter also shifts. So let me grab my sheet that has the title of this piece because it's a little bit haunting, very strange. Um, painted after World War II. It's part of this whole series of works from the late 1940s that are really quite haunting. Uh, this one he titled, Where Are the People I Knew? And it has this old man sort of reaching out and then this young girl who, she makes an appearance in multiple of his paintings. But we've lost the sort of geographic specificity that he had when he was painting at Taos or when he was painting in the Upper Peninsula or Upper Michigan. And it's now this sort of abstract memory of a place. Maybe it's his uh, native Hungary, now the Czechoslovakia, now Czech Republic. And then here's another one from a similar vintage from around 1950 to 55, uh, which he titled New Garden. And you can see that it's a garden with no plants, no flowers. There's one apple hanging off of this almost lightning struck tree. And then this strange alien landscape of craters and holes. And you can see the road has been sort of interrupted by a hole here. And then in the center of the new garden are, is a male and female figure. She looks almost like she's getting up or getting ready and he's asleep or passed out next to him. So he, he, he doesn't write much about this series of works, um, but it's a pretty far cry from his earlier <laughs> landscapes. There's a couple of other um, portraits on this panel. Here we have Marianne Strangel, who was head of Cranbrook's weaving department. Uh, she was here from 1937 through the 70s, and then painted around the same time that Eliel Saarinen stepped down from the presidency of the Academy in 1946, um, and when Zoltan Zepeshi took over as director, here is a portrait of Eliel Saarinen. And he would often paint portraits um, for income as well as for 
artist trades. I've even heard one story where um, Zepeshi, I, I forget the story, I wish I'd written it down. If the person who told me the story is watching, which you might be, correct me in the comments, but Zepeshi needed something done, a table fixed, and this person said, oh, I'll gladly help you out if you'll tell me everything you did not put in your book on egg tempera painting. And so Zepeshi did uh, fill in some of the blanks. Zepeshi was the sort of American master of tempera painting, and he published a book on the subject uh, in 1946 called Tempera Painting. Um, but if you read that book, it is a guide, um, but at the same time, you really could not construct a tempera painting from the way that he wrote. Uh, he leaves plenty of detail out, and he also includes things like build up your paints to the appropriate thickness, um, mix your pigments to the desired consistency. And he even talks about tasting your pigment to make sure that it's correct. And so there's a little bit like Louis Sullivan's Guide to Architectural Ornament. There is a moment where you can have all the ingredients lined up, but the genius is the one who, who holds the secrets as to how to turn egg yolk and pigment into this. So let me pull out another set of paintings. I will leave you here safely on the steps. This painting rack system is a German system uh, and it is designed to increase the storage substantially of the collections wing. It also allows us to have classes and group tours come up and learn about the painting. So let me turn the camera around so that you are seeing the paintings in the correct orientation. Um, so this is a very early Zepeshi from around the time that he immigrated to America. And you can see that it's a much less abstract, much more impressionist. And I think that here you can see when the critics um, would categorize Zepeshi into sort of any 20th century movement of painting, and Zepeshi would say, it's unimportant what style I work in. I think you can see the way that he evolved from his early, uh, the early 1920s, which were also his early 20s, um, to 1966 when he painted these seagulls here. And seagulls make an appearance um, throughout his career but I'm particularly fond of these. These are done the year that he resigns um, from the presidency. He was 68, it was 1966. And here you can see the way that he's not using any white ground in the painting. Uh, that's just the treated masonite board that's coming through. He's not, or he's not using any white pigment. He is just relying on the white ground and the hash marks that are used too have the seagulls come through, look like little humanoid birds in conversation here. Up above is a landscape by Zepeshi from the 1940s. And then on this same rack, we have my personal favorite painting, um, which is a self-portrait of the artist in his Cranbrook studio. And you can almost see the Cranbrook studio windows there in the corner. And then here is Zoltan with his Hungarian uh, sort of passion, which he was constantly commented on, his sort of presence in a room. And then this painting swirling around. It doesn't quite jive with all of the reporters who comment on how neat he was in his studio. Um, but it, is, it does sort of show this, I think, swirling passion of the artist at work. And then another seagull from the 1940s, as well as a study for a mural. And Mr. Zepeshi did complete a number of murals. 
Um, for the Chicago World's Fair of 1933, um, he completed murals for the state of Michigan, for Ford Motor Company, for the Rackham Engineering Building by, uh, in Detroit, and he also completed a mural for the Lincoln Park Post Office. And that mural is currently located in the city of Detroit at the conservation studio of Kenneth Katz. And Kenny Katz has spent the last year working on a complete restoration of Zoltan Zepeshi's mural. Uh, it had been improperly restored earlier and these egg tempera paints are delicate and they had been damaged. So it has undergone a huge restoration and is ready to be reinstalled at its new home, which is the Beaver Island Historical Society. Um, you may know that the center director, Greg Whitcock, has a, a strong affinity for Beaver Island, which is floating off the coast of northern Michigan in the middle of the Great Lakes. And how the mural ended up on Beaver Island, the techniques that were used to restore it, as well as the story of Zoltan Zepeshi getting this work from the U.S. Post Office is going to be the story of a special live virtual event that Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research and the Beaver Island Historical Society are going to be co-hosting this Sunday, August 9th at 3 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, we will be broadcasting live from Beaver Island, where the Historical Society has built a new facility to display the mural and to expand its museum. And we will also be broadcasting live from Detroit from the Conservation Studio. So there are still seats available, um, tons of seats because you're using your living room as the seat. There are still spots online to sign up and join us for that virtual event Sunday at three o'clock. It's going to be great if you have never visited an art conservation lab, um, if you've never heard the term losses on a painting, um, you're going to learn so much from Ken and his expertise, his lifetime of expertise. Ken has worked on countless paintings here from Cranbrook Art Museum. He works for the DIA. He works for museums around the country. And so he is really just an absolute expert to have restored this painting. And it's a great opportunity to learn from the best about how art conservation and preservation works. Greg Whitcock will be delivering a short talk about the history of, mural and of the mural. And then we will hear from Lori Taylor uh, Blitz, uh, who is the director of the Beaver Island Historical Society, who will talk a bit about how the mural ended up far, far away from Lincoln Park, Michigan, which is near Dearborn, and ended up on Beaver Island. So sign up for that on center.cranbrook.edu. You can sign up all the way to Sunday morning. I want to finish talking about Zepeshi today with looking at another set of his works. And if it seems like we have a lot of Zepeshis, we really do. Um, and I am not even showing all of them. One treasure that we have is a study for another mural. This is a mural that was done for the Rackham Engineering Building in Detroit. And it's a, this is the study for the scientist, artist, and farmer mural. And so that's the scientist, the artist, and the farmer all looking into a water droplet and thinking, how can they use water? And so you see the scientist pulling water one direction, the farmer pulling it down to his field, and then the artist on the upper left, uh, represented by Zoltan Zepeshi, a self-portrait, uh, he is dipping his weasel-haired brush into the droplet. And this was executed. Uh, Zepeshi also actually paints the study, that's the ceiling of the lounge it's going into, the pa wall paneling, and then the fireplace it's above. I don't actually know if it is still there. Um, next to this study for a larger mural, we have Dyer's Day from the late 1950s, which if you cut out the man on his um, tuba down here at the bottom, you sort of just have pure abstraction. But even as Cranbrook made it into the world of abstract expressionism and non-representational painting, Zepeshi continued to paint representationally, and so uh, there you have cloth drying. Down below is a um, uh, depiction of Scranton, Pennsylvania, and its iron mills. 
but then some of my favorite works in the collection, a series he did around the same time he did those strange dystopian post-war visions. Uh, around 1947 to 49, he painted a series of views of Detroit. So this is the piece that we um, uh, used as the advertisement for today, which is the back of the Hudson Motor Plant. And I love the sort of story that Zepeshi tells with these paintings. It's still all layers of egg tempera, um, but there is this great billboard that he depicts, Christ at the Peace Table for the R.G. and G.R. Harris funeral home. Uh, then there is this fight scene that's going on in front of the gas pumps. And over here you see the balloon salesman who is uh, selling to the, to the passerby. And then the Hudson Motor Plant is almost like this, a different sort of dystopian landscape in which this urban scene takes place. Now over here is a painting he titled Shift Change, which is the Chrysler Company. And so you see all of the um, workers who are boarding the trolley back to their homes or into the factory at the shift change. And then down below, we see scenes of Belle Isle here with the swimmers. We see downtown Detroit with the department store, the city canyon looking towards the Detroit River before Hart Plaza intervened. And then here we see the cultural center uh, with the Detroit Public Library on the right, and then Paul Philippe Cray's Detroit Institute of Art on the left. And again, it's not just depicting uh, sort of downtown Detroit, there is all this activity going on from the man reading his newspaper underneath the tree to the Woodward Avenue trolley going down to these two kids fighting. And what's interesting is, is he did not paint in plain air. So these were all painted either from his sketches that he would have done or from photographs. He talks about in tempera painting his book that you really can't do it outdoors. It requires far too much control of the paints and of the, uh, the studio conditions. Here is a view of Detroit from Windsor, Canada, also known as South Detroit, <laughs> looking back at the city skyline. And then the view of the Ambassador Bridge. And finally, down here, we see Black Bottom, which was, of course, named uh, the French named it uh, after the black soil that was found here, uh, but it became the center of African-American life in Detroit. This is painted about 1947, 1948, uh, before the entire neighborhood would be demolished in order to build Mies van der Rohe's Lafayette Park as part of the very racist history of urban development and urban renewal schemes in America. I do sometimes wonder as I look at this man who is peddling wares of some sort, if Zepeshi would have felt a kinship uh, to this person because one of Zepeshi's very first jobs in America was as a fur peddler. And he went through the garment district on the lower west side of Manhattan, peddling furs to try and make ends meet. Now he did lead Cranbrook as president until 1966 in a report that was published in 1969. Um, his leadership was questioned. Um, Zepeshi was a little bit ambiguous about his own legacy at Cranbrook. Uh, when questioned about why there was no more endowment, he said, well, Cranbrook's endowment isn't money. It's a spirit. It's the art. It's the environment in which to work. Beautiful sentiment, great pull quote for the Detroit News article, terrible way of leading um, and trying to keep it financially afloat. So uh, he, was, he was the sort of last link in a chain. He was the third pillar of Sarin and Millis and then Zepeshi. Um, and, and I love that so much of his work lives on here. Now, when he would work in the studio at Cranbrook, he didn't work on a, a state, a, 
a movable pallet. He had what he called his tea cart, and it was this uh, sort of piece of furniture on casters with a glass top, and he would have all the jars of different oils. He would use clove oil. Um, he would use all these different pieces, and then he would have the mixed pigments and little sort of dimples on the glass surface, and he would meticulously use his brushes to create layers and layers of, uh, of timbre wash. Um, one interesting thing that I thought was that he varied from the old masters. Um, in his book, he talks about, first of all, that using masonite is a great idea uh, as opposed to wood, which it is true that these are much more stable using a wood compound as opposed to a piece of wood. Um, but that was quite controversial that he painted on masonite. Uh, and then it was also interesting that after he had primed the surface using whiting and zinc oxide, hide glue, and uh, gelatin, he would do another layer of the same priming but add clove oil and that would keep it wet for about 36 hours and he would do the first set of tempera painting onto the wet whiting uh, and that would help, he said, to give it luminosity and depth. So you can learn a lot by reading his book. You can also learn a lot uh, if you order from your favorite used bookstore because it's been out of print since the 60s, Zoltan Zepeshi, 40 Years of His Work. I think it is about time we publish another book that's in color um, and we could learn even more about the man, the myth, the legend. I hope that you enjoyed this Live at Five tour. This is the first one that we've done that hasn't been about a building, so I hope that I did all of my curators of painting justice because history and architecture are my passions. Painting is a uh, passionate interest. So I hope that you enjoyed. If you have other questions, send them in the comments, send us an email. Um, Cranbrook Art Museum, again, has reopened. So Wednesday to Sunday, come check out the galleries. It is free on Thursdays until 8 p.m. You cannot show up at the door. You need to book a ticket in advance. Thanks, Cranbrook Art Museum, for letting me come and talk about so many of these beautiful paintings. Um, thanks to Peggy DeSalle, Zepeshi's second wife, for donating many of these, as well as the family of Chester Bork, uh, as, well as, as well as the really countless donors uh, back in history who have given so many of these wonderful Zepeshi paintings back to Cranbrook. Remember that you can sign up for the upcoming uh, virtual lecture and uh, tour of the studio of Kenneth Katz and Zepeshi's WPA era post office mural hauling in the nets. That will be this Sunday, August 9th at 3 p.m. and you can sign up on center.cranbrook.edu. I hope that you're all doing well. I hope that you're all wearing masks and we look forward to seeing you virtually on Sunday or anytime at the Art Museum in person. I'm Kevin Adkison coming to you with another Live at Five from the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. Be well, everyone.